Hello and welcome to the Business Today show. I am Uday Mukherjee. Today it's not uncommon to see women at the top of their game in practically every profession. They are leading banks, corporations, even legal and accounting firms. But that was not always the case. In fact, you don't have to go back very much in time. Even a few decades ago, it would be fair to say that after a point, particularly in India, women hit some kind of a glass ceiling. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome my guest on the show today, who arguably is one of the first women, if not the first woman, to break that glass ceiling. She was the first Indian woman to do an MBA from Harvard University, go on to head a global bank in India, go on to head a large industry association in India. I mean, the list of firsts is quite a lot, and I'm sure you would have guessed uh, that my guest is no other than the one and only Naina Lal Kidwai. But Naina, but it's, thank you very much for joining in today, and it's a, a great pleasure to see you again. Then such an honor to be with you and uh, lovely to have an old friend back on the screen. So thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, you know, the first question I want to ask you is, I remember that time back in, I think it was 2015, when you, when you sort of uh, put in your papers at HSBC and everybody said, is it Naina quitting too early? I mean, what were you about, 58, not even 60 at that point? Do you ever feel that you could have hung on a little longer? I mean, prolonged your full-time career in that sense, having achieved so much? Did you, did you quit too early? Uh, so then our retirement age was indeed 58 uh, and uh, I chose to retire. They were extending it by a couple of years, but I didn't want to be seen as the one who was extending it to stay on for my benefit because there were others who were impacted. And uh, they did, of course, try and sort of keep me on in advisory roles, etc. But I was quite clear I wanted to break uh, with uh, banking and move on to do other things, a decision I've never regretted because it's given me the ability to not be a slave to others. Uh, you know, when you work in an organization, you work for their uh, uh, agendas. Uh, some of them can be very uncomfortable uh, because there are times when you have to ask people to leave. There are things you have to do which uh, you don't enjoy. What I can do now is to pick and choose what I like and my entire portfolio, and I have by no means retired from work, I've only retired from HSBC, but my entire portfolio today, which gives me a very, very full day, is made up of everything that I enjoy. So it's a mix of, uh, as inevitably, uh, independent director on a few boards, global and Indian, but uh, about 40% of my time, uh, and that committed 40 to 50% of my time, is in not-for-profit work in water, sanitation, environment, and green financing, areas which I'm very passionate about. And uh, I do some advisory work, etc., which keeps me in the flow of what is happening in the world of private equity and investment banking. So a very full portfolio indeed, and not retired at all. Mm -hmm. And I would actually urge everyone who is in the corporate world No, no, I was not suggesting that you're, uh, that you're sitting in your bungalow sipping phase. tea and not doing yeah. anything else. I, uh, Right. No, no, no. I, I, I am aware that you do. You have your hands full, uh, Naina. But, but, but that brings me to my next question, which is, what do you really enjoy more? I mean, would I be uh, stretching the case by suggesting that actually you enjoy the sanitation, environmental work more than the investment banking hats that you still wear? Or do you enjoy keeping a, keeping a foot in the door in that financial world even today? Oh, uh, it, it's actually both. Uh, I do enjoy being in the flow of information and what is happening. And it's uh, too many years of experience to just throw out the window. Uh, the, it is my core competence. It is an area where I can still uh, guide and help and mentor and work in. So uh, I definitely enjoy doing what I used to do. But it does give me time to do some of the things in the sort of broader spaces of uh, water, sanitation, environment, where uh, we are still carving a role for ourselves in the country, uh, very critical roles. Uh, the timing of some of that has been very exciting for me personally, uh, because I started the India Sanitation Coalition with my late husband uh, about six months before the Prime Minister uh, announced the Swachh Bharat mission. So what amazing and lucky timing for us, because it gave us a chance to partner in a very major government program and work very closely with government in that program. And it has been a very rewarding experience. 
but a lot of the work that happens in the NGO world, in the not-for-profit world, is also fraught with frustration. Uh, it's slower than what I'm used to in the corporate world. Uh, you know, the funds are not easy to come by. And uh, if I didn't have that other half, uh, the half that I know well, the world of banking and uh, investment banking and finance, uh, to keep me sort of going, I think the issue I would have with the half that I'm engaging in in the not-for-profit arena would sometimes get me down because it is a very uh, difficult and frustrating world. And I've learned through all the wonderful people I work with there mm -hmm. how to indeed uh, keep a smile on my face even when I'm fuming and fretting and worrying about all that needs to happen that doesn't happen. So they are two <laughs> very different worlds actually and uh, you need right. very different strengths in each. Right. Uh, you know, you've achieved so much, Naina, in your career, uh, and it's been a long one. To, uh, and you're a business leader in your own right. But, you know, the, the thing which sets you apart is that you are a woman in having achieved all of that. And I don't mean it in a, in a bad way at all. The, so, you know, you're a business leader, but you're also a very tall woman business leader. Uh, were you always aware that the celebrity that you always enjoyed as a corporate leader uh, there was some extra scrutiny attached to it because you were a woman. I mean, uh, w was that something which always followed you? Uh, I sadly would, you know, say yes. But I think that scrutiny starts very early in our careers as women. Uh, I know that in the days when I was at Grinley's Bank, one of the first few women in the early 80s, and I think for all of us women who embarked on our careers at that time, we felt like goldfish in a bowl. You always felt you were on display. Uh, there were people just waiting to see you fall and say, oh, see, you know, this is what it was about. For every woman who took maternity leave, it, uh, I think, was another slight for all womankind. And I was very conscious of the fact, and therefore under a lot of pressure personally, uh, that for everything that I did, it was, uh, that, and if it turned out wrong, it was not just a blot against me and my career, but possibly for all women that were following. And that puts one under immense pressure. I don't think that has gone away completely because, you know, we still, sadly, still uh, represent other women, not just ourselves as individuals in our careers as we go. So that pressure is something one just gets to used to, you know, living with and being with. And uh, yes, I do fear that that scrutiny never ends. When you fall, you are noticed much more. When you succeed, fortunately, that too gets noticed. And uh, so it works both ways. Mm. It's so interesting to hear you say this because, you know, exactly something like this happened a few years ago. You know, you'll recall that time when, you know, there were women were at the top of the Indian banking profession. Uh, between uh, Shikha Sharma, Chanda Kochar and Arundhati, they ran three of the top banks in the in the country and people were saying you know what a change I mean who could have ever imagined three women to be at, at the top of India's three top banks uh, and then the Chanda Kocher episode happened and exactly what you just said panned out I mean people there were men smirking saying oh no it was just a matter of time before something like that happened do you think that took a bit of the gloss of the women breaking the glass ceiling story in India uh, I don't think so because I think by then uh, uh, it was of course unfortunate and uh, you know one of our most celebrated women leaders uh, literally falling uh, uh, as she did from a very very high perch which people looked up to is troubling at any time for any leader it didn't have to be a woman but I do think that there were uh, there was that additional scrutiny around it in terms of you know is this about other women too and I'm glad that there were so many other competent women there at the time Arundhati, Shikha, others that have emerged after that as well which has maybe not made it a man-women issue after all there are men who've been in similar situations too uh, so it is I think one of those uh, incidents which while very unfortunate and I think at the time did take some of the sheen of women CEOs who were I think being pushed as if they were, you know, better than men, uh, which I think is always silly because at that level, it is really very individual. You, I have had as many good male bosses as bad ones, and it will always be the case that there will be individuals who in their own right are fabulous human beings and great leaders, 
and individuals who may be smart but are not such good leaders, whether men or women. And I think we have to just take the good and the bad as it goes. You cannot typecast men and women leaders once you're up at that level. True, and it's not a man versus woman issue, but you know, on the subject, uh, a few weeks ago I was talking to Zia Modi on this very show and she said something very interesting. She said, you know then, what, ha what it made me was, it, it just drove me in, in the sense that I would work twice as hard as my male colleagues to stand out and to succeed. Uh, did you ever feel that, that, you know, you, because the benchmarks at that time when you were early in your career were different as, it, as they may be today, uh, you actually had to go the extra mile to stand out? Oh, absolutely. There, No doubt on that one. Uh, I did feel uh, not just the pressure I described earlier of representing all of womankind, but also the pressure to work hard. And it wasn't just Zia. Zia too. I had done a book, 30 Women CEOs, Their Voices, Their Stories, in which Zia was also one of uh, mm. uh, the chapters. And pretty much every one of those women CEOs uh, had felt that pressure of having to work twice as hard to be heard, to be understood and to make their way. And don't forget the working hard doesn't just come from the office environment, certainly in the office environment, uh, but also from trying to balance all that happens at home, uh, where the social pressures of being the ideal uh, wife, mother, daughter-in-law, daughter, uh, all of that too weighs on women as they make their way through their careers. And that aspect of society, the aspect which puts pressure on women to really have two huge roles, one at work and one at home, is one which needs uh, attention. Because until society changes, women carry an unequal and uneven burden into the workplace, even today. No question about that. Uh, and, you know, you, you just said something very important because, you know, I've, I always like to ask women, very successful women, whether their success takes any kind of toll in their interpersonal relationship with their spouse. Uh, because, you know, in India, you expect the man to be the more successful of the two. But often, in, as in your case, and there is absolutely no slight intended uh, in this at all, but you would agree that you were, in a corporate sense, the more successful between you and your husband. Did that ever put any kind of strain or pressure in your uh, interpersonal equations? Uh, there never, because what I had was a husband who was uh, extremely supportive, uh, one who had succeeded in his own right at the time when I moved on to head uh, uh, bank investment banking. Uh, he was, you know, head of marketing at large uh, uh, corporate MNC companies. So he had done his thing there anyway, but his desire to work in the not-for-profit sector was one which we both decided was our joint way of giving back to society. And as both of us couldn't do it, he was going to do it for the two of us. And uh, he really succeeded there. His work with Seva as CEO of Grassroots Trading Network, what he established there, in, even today, Ila Bhatt and Reema Nanavati and those at Seva who work with him, uh, remember him very, very uh, well by. And those achievements are achievements which helped me and guide me in my entry into the not-for-profit spaces because I learned through him to begin to understand the DNA of the not-for-profit sector, the suspicions, the issues, the inability of the not-for-profit sector and corporates to work comfortably with each other, which was really the path which uh, Rashid, my husband, had embarked on, which was to try and get corporates and not-for-profits working together. And for everything he did, he got levers, ITC, these sort of companies working with Seva in a way where typically, you know, revenue models might have been down in the 10 and 20 lakhs. Uh, they went up into crores. And this happened because Ila Bhatt had the insight and understanding and patience to begin to see these links being forged. And they, they didn't happen overnight, you know. They would take two to three years to even get the first exercises working of getting these two sectors which didn't come naturally together. They had tended to be much more about corporates signing checks mm -hmm. to not-for-profits. It was not about working with not-for-profits to help them scale up, to grow, uh, to demonstrate partnership. So when a Fab India comes together with a Seva, it helps Seva to do and make products which can retail 
through Fab India retail. But Fab India has to spend a lot of energy and time and they would get very frustrated on timelines not being met, products not being quite what were required. But that patience, that DNA at the corporate level is as important as it is for the not-for-profit to embrace the training. And similarly, they were, you know, to teach a seva how to do organic chewing seed and have spices, which, could, which is what ITC taught them, even showing them how the product clears customs, uh, so that the packaging and sale could then actually achieve 10 times the price initially uh, than what they were getting by selling in the ro uh, local market. Or a Unilever, which helped them to retail a brand called Rudy, which sold in uh, their retail stores, as in Tata retail stores, and Noel Tata himself staying actively engaged with these kind of joint ventures. Uh, so these are some of the things we have to see a lot more of. And I'm really happy to tell you that in the sanitation space, this is really what we have been seeking to achieve, partnerships. And the best partnerships, the ones that work, are the ones that have corporate, government, and uh, not-for-profit, as in implementers, working together. You know, Nanana, having worked in this field, I mean, in the field of water and sanitation, uh, do you get the sense that large Indian corporations are actually sensitive to the problems of climate change and what's going on around us? Or do you think what's going on is lip service? I mean, they're not, they don't take it that seriously or as seriously as they should be. You specifically said large companies. I think they get it. They're getting the pressure from their investors. They're getting pressure sometimes from the banks, but not enough. Uh, but certainly from the foreign investors and foreign banks. And they're beginning to get it from their stakeholder communities, as I just mentioned. The issue is really much bigger when we look at the MSME world. And I think there we need to really look at corporate parks where the provision right. of these services is happening at a global climate uh, sensitive stance, which is providing these services, you know, energy as in renewable energy, uh, circularity of water being addressed, etc. So it's a provision of an infrastructure service for which the MSMEs in that park pay. It's very difficult for each small company to try and plan and have a program for themselves, even if they want to. Much easier if we can do it around clusters. And I think provision for it, but getting them to pay for it is the answer rather than getting each to do it for themselves. Where the danger then is that sometimes it becomes a tick box exercise sure. where they say they have it, but we see often that a sanitation facility that a real estate company will do for its buildings because it's mandatory, but six months later that facility has fallen apart. And whereas here in the model that I would like to see, the provision of that service, because someone's paying for it, is going to pretty much be operational because the companies that are drawing on that service are going to be asking the provider of the service, why have you not done what you should have done? So we do need to look at it on the one side as a business model and on the other as a provision of a service uh, which is paid for. And that's when we will get some of this uh, answer to operating as a company in a way that is climate sensitive so that we don't have effluents going out, we don't have issues around pollution, right. we do not have uh, uh, energy uh, being drawn uh, that is indeed uh, carbon uh, uh, polluting. Right, and I'm sure you're bringing all this experience to bear on the, uh, on the work that you're doing now with Rothschild and the PE Fund, European PE Fund, because uh, you are engaged on the ESG side uh, of things there. But, you know, you're also a director on some very prominent boards, uh, Naina. And, you know, I want to ask you about y your thoughts on independent directorships in India. Because, you know, a, a few months ago, or was it a year ago, when somebody said very interesting, when this whole NSC Chitra Ramakrishna episode was blowing out of proportion, you know, the point was made that if the board was strong enough, and somebody said this specifically, that if people like Naina and Arundhati were on the board of NSE, this could never have happened, or at least they would have signaled it long ago. Do you believe that that episode could have been prevented and whether independent directors can actually come in the way of preventing such things? You know, the one shortcoming that you have as an independent director is you only get to hear and see what the management presents to you 
And yes, to the extent that you are engaged in, that, in the community and the stock market uh, sort of uh, gossip vibe, that you can pick up signals of what is happening uh, maybe uh, to question uh, the company as to where and what is happening in a particular space. But you, you can be blindsided by management that chooses not to bring certain things up to you. And I'm not familiar enough with what happened at the board level at NSC, but just moving away from NSC, uh, I think where a regulator questions it, uh, clearly that absolutely has to come to the board. So that is certainly one warning bell which a board cannot ignore. Uh, if the management has indeed belled the cat and uh, has been forthright, and I would like to believe that the boards I'm on, that is indeed the case, we hear the bad news well before it actually becomes bad news in the public market, and that is the, re the true way for a good management to operate. Uh, but if it's not operating that way, then you do have to unfortunately rely on a regulator or some information that is then brought to you, whether through a grapevine or through a, a more formal process. So an independent director is not an investigator, as you well know, then, you know, you, you sit there, uh, yes, it's four to five board meetings a year, but you do meet in between that. You read a lot about the company, you understand the business, you're there to help the visioning and strategizing. You're certainly there to ensure that the compliances as are told to you are met. And to the extent that there are auditors, internal auditors, and third party uh, reports, every one of those gets tabled and are read diligently by uh, all of us as independent directors. But if it has been missed by one of the auditors or the information is not brought to you, it's hard to dream up what is going wrong. And I think that is often the lacunae, and it will remain. It is there anywhere in the world that uh, as an independent director, you can only know just that much. But once you know it, how you act is clearly a function which uh, we have to be very conscious of as a custodian of uh, the company's, uh, s not just shareholders, but stakeholders. Uh, so yes, for the minority shareholders, but mm -hmm. also for stakeholders, the community, uh, the uh, various ways in which we engage. And I think that is why as independent directors, we are now going to have to pay more and more attention to the ESG agenda of companies as well, not just because in the investor community is questioning and asking us for it. It helps a company in terms of its valuation, but because it's becoming a hygiene factor. It may mm -hmm. not help you in your share price, but if you don't have the right ESG agenda, you're not able to demonstrate that you're meeting the median, not a bare minimum, but a median at least, even if you're not excelling then uh, you are not going to get investment, whether from a foreign investor or I would like to believe in time also from our domestic mutual fund community. But on the other, the banks uh, relying on this would also have to look at who they lend to and who they don't lend to. And I think we have, as a banking community, have to look much, much closer at where we lend. And we don't have to drop the company like a hot potato, but to ensure sure. that the company can demonstrate progress and change in a meaningful way. And I'm out of time today, but uh, my congratulations on a spectacular career that you've had, and you're such an inspiration to millions of women uh, across the country. But it's been a great pleasure talking to you as always, and uh, we ho I hope to catch, catch up with you soon. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, then. Thank you for your kind words. Lots to do and a lot more to gain and do.